the architecture behind that. Basically, um, in case that wasn't clear, um, the system that Skynet uses, BOINC, is actually uh, an, a kind of open framework for scientific computing, distributed scientific computing. Um, and I just thought I'd give a quick overview of how to set up under Linux. Um, I think a lot of people often don't run things like SETI at home or Skynet or whatever because they don't want it to make their serverless responses, so they can SETI at home or something like that. Um, so what I've done in the past is actually run point projects um, just with a high nice value so that you can, or low nice value, or whichever it is that keeps the process and the scheduling priority. So if you've got like a Raspberry Pi at home or a server or a rack or something, you can have that running consistently, even any services you've got on there, like your own server or whatever, um, will be their responsiveness going to be affected at all by it. Um, so it's a good way to do it. Um, and particularly, you know, I think a lot of people in this room might have a Raspberry Pi at home or something like that they're not really using. Um, and things like that have a low power draw, so you can just run that um, at load with, with Skynet or whatever all the time, and it's a good way to get started with a project like this. Um, so just some notes on just how easy it is to set up. Um, both in Raspbian and Arch Linux, um, you can install a link just with apt-get or with pacman. Um, you can uh, you can start it with um, with init scripts in Raspbian or with um, systemd in Arch. Systemd enable point. Um, this is if you are running X in either of them, you can run this point manager tool, which gives you a pretty decent interface. When you first start up, it'll even let you configure the project from scratch, so you can select from um, a pretty big list of different projects that run on point. Um, if you're running um, the shell, you just run a few commands to create an account for a particular project. This is an example I stole from the SETI at home website. That's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, I think Boink actually came out of that project. I remember I ran SETI at home probably like 10 years ago, but yeah, I'm sure SETI at home was like a standalone app. And then actually they talked to Christian people and decided that they were the universal platform and now you know, setting in mode, folding in mode, and line starting to go to the side, and obviously they're all using the same system. And yeah, you just create an account, you get your account key based on your address and password, you attach to a project with your key, um, and it just runs. Uh, this is an example of the systemd service that runs it. This is the one that actually came with my distribution that my Pi runs, which is Arch Linux. Um, so yes, it's really support setting nice values for the process. So as long as that's there, um, whatever else comes in that wants to use um, CPU on your Raspberry Pi is going to get better priority and it's not going to matter. Um, alternatively, with systemd, you can use um, the CPU shares thing, which configures the C group to have a lower or higher than default share of the, of the CPU. Um, and just in case, yeah, anyone hadn't didn't really know about Boink. Um, there's some other pretty interesting projects you can run. You can run, I think you can run any number of projects in the same Boink instance or yeah, through the service. So um, there's Rosetta at home, which simulates protein folding for disease research. Hydrogen at home for hydrogen um, storage research to do with clean energy. Mine modeling at home, SETI. Uh, they're not all called at home, but it, it is a pattern, I guess. Yeah, the point client allows you to attach a bunch of projects and then determine the scheduling and uh, what you know things like how much CPU you can uh, you know whether it's going to run while idle or, or not idle, and then it all then you can set the time that it will take between switching between different uh, between different apps and and you can wait them. So if you want you know Skynet to get seventy percent CPU time and set it over to thirty percent, you can do that as well. Yeah. See, so, yeah, I I think it's a lot cooler than running the system of load to mine for bitcoins or something. And um, one nice thing about it is you can, you can install it, you can set up the projects and then leave it without even going to the websites of like SETI or Skynet. And then a few months later, you can actually go to look at the web front ends that the projects run and see what you've done and compare between projects and the impact you've had and stuff like that. Thanks. Cool. Thank you.
things. Um, I got a bunch of brand new servers in my job and I went, right, okay, I've got all these brand new servers unknown. I'm going to, you know, heat stress relieve them somewhat. I'm going to run DNC and, you know, make them do something. And then after a little while I found a lot of this boink stuff in the SETI at home and I thought maybe I could be doing something more useful than, you know, just cracking RC5 stuff. There's got to be, you know, more useful things out there. And eventually I found the Skynet and so it's a browser-based thing. And eventually they released a Java client for... Uh, for the Neris, uh, the, the, what is it coming up? Yay. All right. So eventually I got the, um, the Java client running in Linux and I had a few cores sitting on the box at home and I thought, okay, maybe I'll move this to my server boxes at work. And while these boxes are in dev and they're doing nothing else, um, I'll, uh, I'll get busy. No, that's the wrong one. What have I done with it? Here we go. Okay, so um, first part of this is how I got 50 million credits on, on, uh, on the Skynet. So I've got 12 servers with 24 cores and an awful lot of free time and waiting for lots of things to happen in my job. And these machines are sitting here idle. And so eventually when, um, eventually when uh, I sort of came back to it, I realised, hey, this is crunching rather quite a lot. Um, I, you know, spent a little bit of time and effort trying to get it all working. Uh, rather nicely. And so um, then they started issuing some challenges about how, um, let's see if I can make that work better. Is that, is that doing it now? Yep. All right, so um, there's this lovely little table here of everyone's got their login and how much credit they've, they've got and whatever else. And so um, I spent quite a lot of time sort of optimising. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> I just got my ham radio license and I was really excited and I was naming everything after my call sign, you know, so. Um, but I spent quite a lot of time trying to figure out how to make the most of the Java client and keep it running and it was really manual and I had 240 cores, I was trying to keep processes running and stuff. So I ended up scripting lots of things away. Um, and the whole process was, you know, pretty tedious. But after a while I got things all sorted out. And then after all, they started issuing some challenges and there was more interesting stuff coming on the community and they were announcing more stuff in there. And so I was actually really quite excited about the whole idea. And then I started reading more about radio astronomy and because I'm doing ham radio and this radio astronomy is like, it, you know, it's quite similar in many regards. You've got radios, you do receivers, your antenna systems, you've got all this cool stuff. Um, and then I started catching up to other participants in the in the thing and then you know there was this big prize offered and they were talking about you know what at the one year an anniversary thing uh, was going to happen and there was going to be you know some prizes and I thought okay I'll put some effort into and try and keep everything up and running and I wrote a lot more code to keep thing up uh, to keep things going and I came out quite doing quite well so um, but this is a Java, I was doing all my work in the Java client uh, on Linux boxes, not in a browser. Um, you can, you know, open a browser and create one process and contribute. I was contributing quite a lot, so um, it's really cool that you can actually put back into a community that actually does something, because, you know, RC5 cracking keys is kind of pointless. Um, and it's still like one of those things where, you know, SETI at home, it didn't really have a lot of appeal to me, but, you know, the radio astronomy thing I thought was actually really quite cool. Um, so, come the one year anniversary of, of uh, the Skynet project, um, I got a, a very exciting email saying, would you like to come and see the, 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 the SKA site? And I just about fell off my chair when I got that email. So yes, it was, you know, it was really, really cool. Uh, where is this? Okay. So, um, I flew, I basically came out of Perth. Uh, landed in uh, here and went and talked to the folks at ICRA and we drove ten and a half hours up to Murchison and it was a very long way but it was absolutely worth it so this gives you an idea of that red dust on the site and these are a couple of the dishes, these are the dishes at the very middle of the ASCAP site so these dishes are ten metres across so it kind of gives you a bit of a scale of what's going on what else we got? Oh, that's accommodation so everyone gets around like this. Every little vehicle has a little yellow stripes down the side. It's, it's very, very different to what you're used to, you know, driving around. Uh, flat tyres. Bloody hell. Um, so this is, this is a, a view from near that hut, the, 
the engineering hut in the middle of the MWA. You can see how red everything is. They talked about the breakaways as that little, that little plateau there. Um, and this is what they was called to me, was described to me as the, um, the graveyard of antennas. And so these are the, this must have been the original yeah, prototype array, yeah? So these are a different, quite a bit different shape to the, the current ones that are there. Pardon? Well, this is the end of 2011. So this this was the old set, and the new set was already in when I when I was there. So. <laughs> so this is people busily working away in that engineering hut, and this is uh, a receiver there, which is about to be deployed out into the field. Um, so up the back here, this chap up here was a. Um, he was an astronomy researcher. Um, we had some other folks there from, from ICRA, um, but there was an astronomy student there was that you know was describing to me, giving me the backstory of lots of things. And so you'd hear various buzzwords and lots and lots of abbreviations, and he would go, oh, that means, you know, blah, blah, in the background. Um, so that was really, really uh, quite interesting. Where are we? Oh, OK. So this is in the data center that we're talking about. And so on the door, we saw that big door before. This is the double. Uh, so there's two layers here of um, the fingers in the door to actually earth everything and make sure everything's sh shielded properly. Uh, so there's a data center, loads and loads of racks. At that point in time, we're all empty. Um, but up the back here, there was just, I don't know, thousands and thousands of fibers that were being run from the big dishes, from the A to D converters of the dishes, back to the data center. And so to keep that RF noise down, um, the, the, the A to C, A to, so for, from the telescope, you're bringing the analog stuff down into a digitizer and then it's running over fiber back to the, the data center. Here's another view of that door. Dishes. Okay, so in, in the, you have the dish at the top there and in the bottom here you have um, what they call the pedestal. And in there you have all of the, f the coax coming down from in individual little patch antennas on the top of the dish coming back down in here and they're patched into, you know, I'm not sure how many, and these are 188 cables, I think, coming down into this patch, which then go into ADCs, which then go digital off. So what that is, is, is um, at the focus of the ASCAP dishes is what's called a phase range beam. Yep. And so what they actually do in digital, what we do in analog, so we have the, the, those as a ley line. Yeah. Which is why it's a significantly more expensive project to have been built. Yeah. What, what they win by is they get they have one ten meter dish that has looking at thirty six places in the sky at the same time. Yeah. Because the focus is different for every little point on the top. Well it, it samples the whole focal plane. So instead uh, of just being at a point, they shift it down it, it samples the whole plane. Yeah. And they, they basically generate thirty six individual beams. No one's ever really tried to do it from an astronomy context before. So it's it's a lot of geotonic and CSIRO. Okay. So there's a couple of these motors to turn things around, um, you know, move the dishes side to side. There's actually quite a lot of power goes into actually moving around just a little 10 litre dish like that. So I just, you know, I went and visited the, um, the Parks dish and sort of stood there for about an hour thinking about how much that thing weighs and how much energy you've got to put in to move it around. And when I saw this, I thought, you know, that's a little motor about yay big, it's a couple of kilowatts. You know, how big is the Parks dish and how many tens of hundreds of kilowatts. Hey? Surprisingly small. Gearing, eh? Yeah. Interestingly, the, the park dish, obviously, I've been, being involved with the Canberra Deep Space Centre, I have to point out that it's not quite as big as the one in Canberra. But to you, the, the, a lot of this is done just by um, um, reducing friction as much as possible. Yeah. So, um, the SS43, which is the big dish, the 70 metre dish at, at um, the Canberra Deep Space Centre, it's 4,000 tonnes, the whole thing, <laughs> but it floats on a, a fraction of a millimetre layer of um, hydraulic fluid, and once that's happened, it's got a few, uh, you know, tens of horsepower motors that just push the thing around wow. really, really easily. Um, so, yeah, it's all hydraulics and friction reduction. Okay. It doesn't move quickly, but it moves easily. Yeah. 
So you're feeding a lot of a lot of coax from a dish that moves in a plane that moves down through these lots of trays in order to get the coax down and inside the uh, inside the building. So they have a manual, and obviously these things are all automated from the control centre. But there's a manual box for every little uh, every little dish, um, and you know so you can control each of the the, the degrees of freedom in there. So. Um, this is the um, the uh, not the, this is pre the correlators in the um, I can't remember what this one is. I think this is where all the coax comes in from the dishes uh, into where it's actually the A to D converters in the hut. This has all changed since I was there, and they've they've centralised this all in the um, either all in the the pedestals or they've moved it all to the data centre. But there was a, a little hut here which did the initial testing for a whole bunch of the, the ASCAP dishes. And so part of that is uh, an yet another rack with some storage and some compute for you know, doing that same reduction of data down to the useful parts. And this is what they call the correlators, which is the, the, the custom hardware, which then takes all that data and makes it into a, a more useful, I think, I assume it does all the FFT and stuff. OK, so. Um, this is from the, the MWA as they were doing the calibration testing for um, a whole bunch of the tiles. And if I zoom in a little bit. So we've got a receiver and a bunch of tiles and you can see that little peak there is around 200 megs from memory. Um, and so you can see the shape of these is a little bit different and there's an X and a Y in each of those. So for each tile you've got an X and, an, and a Y. And so they're the, I believe, the summed uh, for the whole tile for the X and the Y. And you can see there that some of these are, are quite different shapes because they can see different parts of the sky. So at that point in time they're calibrating a lot of these, um, uh, all of the tiles. What have we got happening here? Okay, so um, that's not very easy to see, is it? But we've got a Y channel and an X channel, and so you can sort of see the same spectrum across each of those, and they're somewhat slightly different shapes. Um, you know, I stopped taking photos for a while because I was listening to lots and lots of descriptions. <laughs> um, all right, so that was the antenna graveyard from the previous ones, but that just gives you an idea of these broadband, um, the dipoles. So the little insulator here at the bottom. Um, I'm not sure what's going on there. Oh, okay, so that's the bottom of one there, and then that's the, another one behind it, so you can see the insulator on the other side, but there's a, an earth strap there and stuff. So that's the centre in there that goes into the, 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 ampl the LNAs in the middle. So to each tile, we have an X and a Y cable that goes out from the receiver. Um, I don't know, it's another shot of the tiles. Oh, and this is the receivers. So. I assume that each of the tiles comes back to a receiver has an exactly the same length cable and the store the spare is stored on, a, on the spool? We've got five or six different lengths of cable but we want to try and keep it to a minimum number of different lengths. So yeah. Okay, so... It also saves three terminating cable. So yeah, there was quite a few of these spools sitting there with all the extra cable sitting on. Yeah. I don't know if I've got any photos of that. Um, so a lot of these were this particular lot um, were all uh, created by the students, um, I believe at Curtin at the time. Um, and you know, the human side of this is this was number 1969, and it's got Apollo 11 written on it and an eagle. You know, so this is this is for me the human side of um, the whole project, and um, you know the the humour and the people there was it, it was just a lovely touch to see all the other little bits and pieces going on. Um, actually, I was really quite interested in this. This is the timing syncing to keep all of the receivers so that they, they're, they're capturing frames at all exactly the same time. Um, I can't remember exactly what the pulses were going on here, but this was going out, was it 655 megs? Or no, 16 bits. Yeah. So, 
I was learning quite a lot as I was going through this because, you know, I was thinking from this from a ham radio perspective and going, okay, what am I going to need, what, what can I learn from this because there's so much going on at different levels and syncing time from GPS and, and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so this is actually back at Curtin um, and these, this was the, uh, one of the prototypes uh, and more prototypes, I assume. There's a whole bunch of these antennas there on display, so. Um, and I assume this is sort of like the prototype for that Christmas tree one that, 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 that Kirsten was talking about. And more prototypes. Why did they choose, you know, to make things in this particular way? Do you guys know? <laughs> it's got a bit more flair, has it? <laughs> Goes faster. All right, so this is a photo I grabbed from somewhere, and so this shows those Christmas trees that Kirsten was talking about earlier. Bother. So you can sort of see that it's quite similar to that sort of shape thing. Uh, where are we? Anyhow, uh, what have we got here? Oh, that's that data center which we saw before. Okay, so yeah, so this was sort of on the north west side. The sunset was over here, it was really beautiful. Um, one of the guys from ECRA did a whole bunch of time-lapse photography and there's beautiful shots of the stars going over and whatnot. And so this is that, um, has that, that breakaway on the end of it there. So yeah, it was actually a really, really exciting uh, journey up and back. And it was a week of 40, so it was, you know, we really had to work for it. So cool, thank you very much. <laughs>